Hello, I'm Dr. Thomas Hitchcock, and welcome to this episode of the series Beauty and the Bacteria, an exploration into the world of the skin microbiome. In this series, we're taking a closer look at the entangled nature of our skin's relationship to the microbes that live on and in the skin, and how that affects our lives from birth till death. We've spent the last few episodes exploring the science behind the microbiome and the microbes in general. But in these next three episodes, we will discuss how microbes or microbe-derived products are already being marketed within the skincare arena, and how while the awareness of the microbiome is a good thing, we need to be careful not to fall prey to the gimmicks that can become prevalent when it comes to any new and hot topic where money is to be made. There is indeed an emerging trend for everyday skin products to claim some sort of microbiome-friendly or microbiome-gentle designation. This is basically talking about how those products do or do not interfere with the balance of the microbiome. Because there are no current regulatory standards about how to measure if a product is microbiome gentle, friendly, or safe, companies are defining such terms for themselves, which could be a good thing or a bad thing depending on the ethics of any given company. However, it is indeed a move in the right direction, and as the skincare industry catches up, we will likely see regulation around such claims at some point. However, products that call themselves microbiome friendly, safe, or gentle, by insinuation do not actively affect the skin microbiome composition to make it worse, but also do not necessarily make it any better either. To that end, another trend is the emergence of products that claim to interact directly with or to use elements of the microbiome itself to make the skin microbiome interaction better, healthier, and more balanced. This is via microbe derived and related products. And the ways in which these products are mainly marketed is by using three key words, all beginning with the letter P. Prebiotics, probiotics, and postbiotics. In this episode, we'll start with the most well-known of the three topics, probiotics. As we mentioned in a previous episode, the definition of the word probiotic has evolved over time and is still somewhat ambiguous within the discipline, but it typically refers to the use of a number of live microbes, usually bacterium, for beneficial purposes. When we consider the gut microbiome, one can go to the local grocery store and find any number of products that can claim some sort of probiotic benefit. Some are refrigerated and some are not. Some contain prebiotics and some do not. They typically have a laundry list of strains that mainly consist of gut or dairy-related lactobacillus and bifidobacterium strains, like Lactobacillus acidophilus, Lactobacillus casei, Lactobacillus ruteri, and Bifidobacterium lactis. This list is far from exhaustive. Some of the strains commonly found in these products have indeed been studied for longer and have more scientific and even clinical support when it comes to potential health benefits. Yet, it has been found that the benefits of probiotic organisms can't always be attributed to the whole species of microbe, but are often specific to a subspecies or strain. As such, some of the strains used are just gimmicks and not known to confer much, if any, health benefits. Much of what you see when shopping for probiotics may be little more than clever marketing tactics, appealing to our psychological assumption that more equals better. If 38 billion live cultures are good, then 58 billion must be better. Are 10 strains good? Then 18 strains must be better. While it is generally agreed upon that some gut health probiotics can be helpful for certain indications, just because a product carries the moniker probiotic doesn't necessarily make it beneficial to your health, given the lack of standards and regulations. That being said, when it comes to skin health, companies are scrambling to jump on the biome bandwagon. And since probiotics for gut health have been around so long, and the infrastructure to produce gut-related bacterial strains is established and commoditized, many skincare ingredient manufacturers have adopted these into their portfolios and are pushing them to skincare companies purporting that it will allow their skincare products to make probiotic claims. But there are a couple of issues here. 
When you look at the majority of skin-related products on the market that claim some sort of probiotic ingredient, you'll find that they typically fall into a few categories. The first being live gut or dairy-related strains, second being dead gut or dairy-related strains, or pieces of such, third being lysates, or the guts of a bacteria if you will, and finally ferments of gut dairy-related strains, which are actually postbiotics, which we'll discuss in another episode. These ingredients being used in skincare is not an issue. The issue lies in these ingredients being referred to as probiotic, when they're not. Simply consisting of a microbe or parts of a microbe do not mean something is probiotic. If that was the case, then using MRSA or flesh-eating bacteria on the face could be considered probiotic. So why then would or should gut or dairy-related microbes or their parts be considered a probiotic when used in skincare? In previous episodes, we discussed that the microbes that reside in the microbiomes of the different areas of the body must find that area of the body hospitable in order to live there and exert any type of long-term influence or benefit. Gut-related bacteria like lactobacillus species are plentiful in the gut and mouth, but they are not found on the skin in any appreciable amounts. The skin of the face is a much different ecosystem than that of the gut or mouth. There are different temperatures, different food sources for the microbes, different pH, etc. If we think of the skin as an ecosystem like the Earth, you wouldn't try planting, say, a banana tree in Antarctica just because in tropic areas they're great at feeding monkeys. Because monkeys don't live in Antarctica. And neither would a banana tree. So then why would it make sense to use gut microbes that are not able to live and function properly on the skin? Now, some experimental models have shown that some gut-related strains, such as Lactobacillus ruteri, may have benefits to skin such as anti-inflammatory or even antimicrobial properties. However, little if any of the evidence seems to suggest that this is possible outside of a petri dish. A microbe outside of its niche is basically a fish out of water. It can survive for a short time and then it either makes a nice meal for something else or simply decomposes. So while live gut bacteria for the skin may not make the most sense, the lysate or pieces or ferment products of these strains may have some sort of effect on the skin. But the issue is whether these effects are good for the skin or not. For example, certain parts of some bacterial strains can cause inflammatory reactions in human cells, like lipopolysaccharides found in the bacterial cell walls. Yet other lysates have been shown in laboratories to be effective in reducing inflammation. UV damage and barrier repair similar to more traditional skincare ingredients. So if there is not an additional benefit to ingredients found in traditional skincare, the lysate becomes just another bell or whistle to promote another run-of-the-mill product calling it probiotic, deservedly or not. A growing demand for probiotics in general has led to the need for stricter requirements for scientific evidence of alleged probiotic benefits. In a 2015 publication titled Selective Manipulation of the Gut Microbiota Improves Immune Status in Vertebrates, the authors describe what most researchers in the field consider the characteristics that a microbe should have to be considered a true probiotic. The authors state that a probiotic must have the capacity to survive the relevant areas of the body that they're to be used in. They should display high resistance to any environmental stressors specific to that location. They should lack any transferable antibiotic resistance genes and be able to confer clear benefits to the host through the modulation of the resident microbiome. Additionally, they mention that they should be non-pathogenic, non-toxic, and provide protection against disease-causing microorganisms by means of multiple inherent mechanisms. While currently at the time of filming this, almost no brands that boast the probiotic claim actually meet these requirements, a select few are emerging. And this is no small feat. As you can imagine, finding skin-relevant strains that meet the requirements to be truly considered skin probiotic is one thing. It's quite another to invest in an infrastructure to produce those strains and to develop formulations that allow them to remain stable for an acceptable amount of time to be used by the general population. These are indeed hurdles that need to be overcome to bring novel and effective true skin probiotic technologies to the market. And while most companies have opted to take the easy and somewhat pseudoscientific route, there have been at least a couple organizations that have invested in the infrastructure to bring true microbiome science to the consumer. And that concludes this discussion on the first of our three Ps for the skin, probiotics. 
We hope that this has been helpful for your understanding of what exactly may and may not be worth your spending your hard-earned dollars on and what potential we should expect for taking skin care and turning it into true biome care in the not too distant future. In the next episode, we'll pick it up from here and discuss the next P, prebiotics. As always, we love hearing from you. So please send us your questions, comments, or topics that you'd like us to cover to comments at beautyinthebacteria.com. You can also follow us on social media listed here to watch our Q&A sessions, interviews, or to send us your questions and receive updates on this series, as well as other news and information on skin microbiome initiatives at Crown. From all of us here at Crown Laboratories, thank you for watching. And remember, you have billions of bacteria on your face, and we think that's awesome. Goodbye for now. <laughs>